and welcome back to the actual last one of the six film clips around Agile Excellence by Karen Growth. So as you know by now, we're building this on the Agile Manifesto and even more so on the modern Agile concept, which lifts the Agile Manifesto uh, to something broader than software development and also very nicely captures the gist, the spirit of Agile. Even modern Agile has its challenges I've found working with Agile organizations now for a decade. And with care and growth, we can help out with some of those challenges. So modern Agile and care and growth together. That's the thing to do. So this uh, version then, or yeah, what should we call it? This variant of an Agile manifesto, the Agile Excellence by Caring Growth, captures five challenges working with Agile that I've seen. And we've now had one overview uh, clip and one of each uh, of the four first challenges. And today we're then going to explore the last one in the list, repetitive retrospectives, I call it, um, since retrospectives is such a wonderful thing and we need to do it often. We do it often according to the agile processes and still people might find it repetitive, a little bit boring and even sometimes pointless. And I just want to share with you the concept of walking to walk well that can help out with this and give retrospectives the star stardust it should have. Right. Um, the Agile principles that we've referred back to uh, in each instance of these clips. Uh, now we're looking at the 12th one. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. So let's dig into that. Walking to walk well. We have a story um, that we call walking up the mountain. So this story is about two friends. They actually both work together and spend some time in, in their weekends together. Let's call them Fred and Joe. So Fred and Joe on this Saturday are going to walk up a mountain. Fred, he sets out to reach the peak, to reach the top as quickly as possible. And he uh, struggles and, and works really hard he doesn't lose any time on the way, uh, doesn't stop at all. He just makes sure to get to the top as fast as he can. When he reaches the top, Fred looks around to admire the view. And what, what does he get to see? Well, there has now become low clouds, so he cannot see the view. So Fred is terribly disappointed. He cannot see the view. He's actually hot and thirsty and he tore his clothes on some thorn bushes on the way up. So Fred is not a happy chappy and by that time here comes Joe. Joe also reaches the top although Joe he actually set out in the morning to have a nice walk up the mountain and he used the top uh, as his goal to do so but his aim was to walk well. So uh, as he walked up he regularly took a, a short break to look at the view, to admire the flowers, to see the butterflies flying around and to feel the nice feeling of the sun on his back. So you can imagine his surprise when he got up to the peak. Well, he did get there a couple of minutes after Fred uh, at this point, but why was Fred so, so hot and angry and, and disappointed with everything? Well, Fred said, it was hard work getting here. And now that I'm here, I can't see the view even. And Joe just didn't understand what he was talking about. What was the big difference here? So to look into what was actually the big difference here, we will uh, look at an example. This will be a little bit of a crash course if you haven't done the care and growth. Uh, but Fred and Joe, they also work together, as I said. And they have the same manager. And we have now an example here of their manager talking to Fred and Joe respectively. So the boss says to Fred, Fred, 
1980, very old manager this, in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did worked. So don't argue with me, shut up and go and do what I did. Okay, so to Joe, this boss says, Joe, in 1980, I did what you have to do now and what I did worked. It may be helpful to you to take a look at it. Okay, so what's the main difference here? Who will, want, who will work for the boss because they have to? Who will work for the boss because they want to? Well, I'm sure you figured this out already. Fred will work because he has to and Joe because he wants to. But what is actually the difference? Well, at first glance, it might be, you know, that in the Fred case, he doesn't really get much of a choice. His boss is just saying, do what I have to, what, what I did, uh, don't argue with me, go and do it. Uh, and in the Joe interaction, I mean, he gets a bit of a choice. He, it may be helpful to take a look at it. What is actually at play here is something beneath the surface, the intent of their boss. So let's look at that. To do that, we will look at the two variables of means and ends. And we will look at the person and the job and sort this out. In the Fred interaction, the boss is clearly trying to make sure he gets the same result as he did before. So his ends is the job that is to be done. And if that is the job, Fred is his means, his resource to do this job. In the Joe interaction then, since Joe is given the opportunity to either look at this, uh, get inspired, do it in the same way, do it if we don't really know how the result will end up. It might well be a disaster for all we know. So actually what the boss is doing here is that he's trying to teach Joe something. So Joe, the person is his ends and the job is his means to teach Joe something. This makes all the difference. In the Fred interaction, what we're looking at is what we in care and growth call a taker's behavior. And it's in the Joe interaction, a giver's behavior. If you think that leadership is about achieving a result through people, that is actually about the taker's behavior. And by the way, this is by far the most common uh, way that people see leadership today. So if we are then to turn means and ends around, we also need to turn this statement around. So pay attention because this is quite a journey. How about this? Leadership is about achieving people through results. The job of the boss is the care and growth, the empowerment of the subordinate. Wow. Okay, but weren't we talking about walking up mountains here? How does it relate to this? Let's use the same example and we would just change then who walked up the mountain because they wanted to, who walked up the mountain because they had to. Well, we have the Fred and the Joe and Fred says, I will walk up the mountain to reach the top as fast as possible. And Joe said, I will walk up the mountain to walk well and I will use the top as my goal. You can see where this is going. Fred is really walking because he has to, to reach the top while Joe is walking because he wants to. And then he also reaches the top. So if we take the same sort of table here with means and ends and the person uh, in the Fred interaction, the ends is, okay, so it's not the job, it's the top. And the means is the walk. And in the Joe interaction, the walk is the ends. And the top is the means to have this nice walk. Can you see the difference? So what Fred is doing to himself is really a taker's behavior. And what Joe is giving to himself is a giving behavior. 
What about this uh, give and get, give and take? What goes where? So this um, model is also from the care and growth. If we look at outcome and process, what is on the get, what is on the give side? Clearly, process is on the give side because that is what you contribute with and what you have control over. The outcome is what you get. It's the result of what you do. It comes to you. You cannot go after it. Let's do another one. Contribution result. Well, I already gave that away, didn't I? Contribution is on the give side. Result is what you get. How does this now relate to retrospectives? I'd like to connect that with how and what. Where does the how go? Where does the what go? The how is on the give side. How and what? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's that good old walnut that we talk about. So it all relates to the walking up of mountains and retrospectives, the what and the how. To do a retrospective is to reflect on how we do things, not just what we do. And we often forget the importance of how. And I think, so retrospectives obviously talk to the how. And I think this is what might happen. This is one of the reasons why retrospectives don't always feel as important as they should, I think. So there is another piece to this, and that is to make the retrospectives really good and, and um, useful. We now know why we should do them. Let's have a look at how to do them. So this is from uh, Diane Larson and Esther Darby's book, Making Good Teams Great, and from the XXL Agile and Lean Coaching by Team Giraffe. A retrospective includes five steps. The first is a check-in. So, and by the way, these five steps can easily be adapted to any sort of meeting that you're running or exercise. First of all, the check-in. We can't expect people to come from a back-to-back -back meeting or from uh, leaving the kids at school or from an argument with their boss or something else. Just rush into a retrospective and be creative. Just doesn't work that way. You need to have a bit of a check-in. The next thing you, you need to do, which I also think is, is, is often forgotten, is to set the scene. Uh, so the scope uh, of a retrospective in the scrum environment is often the last sprint. But I suppose it could also be that you do a, a, a retrospective over the year or over a certain feature development you've done or something like that. But make sure that you actually set the scope. Then I would also like to encourage people to dare to set a theme. Don't be worried uh, that you'll miss out on stuff. We'll get back to this with a theme. Be courageous, try it out, set a theme for your retrospective. Then you do the step number three. That is when the, the, the sticky notes all go up on the whiteboard and we collect the data. This is what people think of quite often when they think of retrospective. And it is an important step, but it is actually step three out of five. So there are more things to it than just the collection of data. It's not just the sticky notes. Number four is to generate insights. So here we want to take a step back, preferably collectively, like, like the whole group has been involved, the whole team who's done the retrospective. Take a step back from your whiteboard, see what do we have here? Where are the red notes? Where are the green notes? Uh, where do we have like groups of notes? Whatever it is. And then number five, identify and land actions and make sure to have them vital few and make sure to take them to your team board your scrum board uh, so that you will work with them right some ideas for themes then i, I promise that we'd get back to themes uh, so themes is a way to to limit the limit the scope really it's a version of scope uh, 
for example, you can you can focus this retrospective on our communication within our team. Uh, then you might argue, okay, but what about all other questions that don't have to do with uh, our communication within our team? Well, they'll come up another time. Since we do retrospectives every sprint, this is a way to vary it and make it interesting. Another idea for theme could be our velocity, which is actually what we're going to do in the theme I'm running right now. Next, next sprint retrospective, we're going to have that as our theme, our velocity. Another thing you could do is our collaboration with other teams. How does that work? What works well? Uh, what do we want to change? New ideas. Our collaboration with our line manager or line managers, depending on how your uh, organization looks. How does that work? Is there some things that we want to try out? Etc. Etc. I mean, the sky is the limit. Talking about the sky is the limit or your fantasy is the limit. Let's have a look at a few ideas for how to collect data that can be varied without limit. Look here for a few examples. So this, I think, is the most traditional one. This must be the mother of retrospective collections. <laughs> what is good that we want to keep? What do we want to change? What new ideas do we have and appreciation within the team? The four fielder. Can't miss it. But also, you don't want to do it every time. It will become boring. So here's another example of what we did a couple of years ago. A Christmas retrospective. Which went then suits better in December than in, <laughs> than in April. But in April, you could always do an Easter retrospective, I suppose. So here, for example, we have uh, Santa about the deliveries. We have angels with what helped us, um, the reindeer, what moved us forward. And we have um, the new year fireworks there with wishes for the future. Be brave, try it out, experiment. What could go wrong? So how to succeed with retrospectives? Follow those five steps that uh, Diane Larson and Esther Darby put together. It's really good. It's really helpful. Vary both theme and data collection method. It will be a lot more fun. And make sure to follow up the actions. It will kill any creativity if the same things come up sprint after sprint after sprint. So you want to make sure that the things that you identify as actions is something that you can uh, that you can affect. And you also want to make sure that you work on them. Great. Finally, make sure that you see the how as important as the what. And here it connects back to the walking up the mountain. Walk to walk well. Do what you do well. That is the how. And that is just as important if not even more important than the what actually, because the what will come. So walnut, what, how, retrospectives. I hope you found this useful and please check us out on the website. Oh yes, and here comes the model as well. Sorry, forgot about that one. Good luck. Mm -hmm.